is very difficult to predict future, especially in this uncertain world. And if you take the example of uh, RCEP, very odd number of countries have come together uh, for some economic benefit who have quite the political differences are very strong. Uh, and the classic example can be China and Australia, which are right now at the loggerheads on several issues, uh, several strategic issues, but are also tied up by the same agreement, which was, uh, which government of India at some time point showed willingness to join, but at the end walked out of it because of, partly because of the domestic compulsions and partly because of uh, changing global scenario and at the hindsight uh, now the experts are saying that we have taken the right decision of not joining our side. Similarly, if you see uh, the SARC example, uh, because of the very clear attitude of Pakistan, there was a need to bring the neighborhood countries on a different platform and the BIMSTEC platform was, has emerged and so on and so forth, I can give you examples. So, but also in the, the traditional uh, kings or kinhood has also seemed to be making less relevant, if not totally relevant. And one of the classic example is the NATO alliance, which, uh, which uh, was formed for the security of entire Western world after World War II. But uh, especially during uh, the presidency of Mr. Trump, uh, NATO has been given less and less uh, importance. Mr. Trump has put enormous pressure on NATO countries to enhance its military spending and therefore saying that they cannot perpetually remain dependent on US for their security needs. And on the other side, you have also seen that just before COVID, uh, or uh, sorry, during the COVID, uh, the strong anti-China statement to be issued by the European Union was diluted and criticism of China was uh, actually uh, removed from the EU statement under pressure of certain European countries. So these are the kind of uh, fluxes that are happening uh, in uh, world all over. And COVID has actually uh, compelled everyone to uh, almost like a reboot button in the, uh, in the term of uh, IT, if I may say so for everyone to rethink their domestic priorities as well as their global interests. And because I uh, come from healthcare background, I would say that uh, in a post uh, COVID new world order, my sincere hope uh, is that people will start thinking more about uh, healthcare, not as a luxury of few, but also the quality healthcare, which is affordable. In Europe, it, is, it was always there because of very strong public healthcare system, but uh, their limitations have also come out very strongly, especially in the countries like UK, where they simply couldn't provide uh, healthcare to several elderly people and by a certain their own critiques, a lot of elderly people were quote unquote allowed to die uh, in order to save the younger population. And the large amount of deaths that have happened in old age care homes in UK has shown the limitations of NHS as a system. Similarly, in the countries like India, there was enhanced uh, emphasis on privatization of healthcare. We'll have to now rethink about the public healthcare system, which is relatively good in India, but not adequate 
both in terms of quantity as well as quality. Uh, we will have to rethink how we should reshape the healthcare system in order to have both affordability and the quality uh, being the basic uh, principle behind the healthcare system. And uh, I can give you many more examples uh, of this kind. So my uh, immediate thought is that people will start investing in the quality healthcare system in, uh, because if there's another pandemic like uh, COVID in the future and no one is uh, denying that possibility, similar challenges uh, will emerge, maybe more grave challenges will emerge. And in that case, it will be impossible to face those uh, that pandemic uh, with the current infrastructure. Second uh, part is definitely uh, an environment or climate change. And people have become more conscious about climate change, more conscious uh, about protecting environment, and that's a good development. And there will be a lot of green movements will take shape in future. That is what I feel. On the other hand, as Professor Mahapatra has clearly stated out that China will emerge as a major challenge, not only to India, but also to almost all the countries who believe and who would like to abide by the rule of law and certain principles of uh, international relations in spite of differences. And you, many of you must have heard the word wolf warrior diplomacy where there is a movie called wolf warrior many of you must have seen uh, and then there are uh, on in the finance sector there are many such wolves uh, always present who uh, virtually try to decimate any of uh, any potential rivals and similar such a wolf warrior diplomacy is now being played by China. And if you see uh, current disputes of China with in the international audience, so ex except barring two or three countries, China has dispute and major dispute with practically every country, not only in its neighborhood, but also in the far distant countries. Some disputes are uh, very overt, some disputes people are not willing to define, uh, but they are there. Part of it, uh, the reason is also because of the very aggressive uh, pushing of Chinese agenda across the globe under the leadership of uh, President Xi Jinping. Uh, and that has caused initially People thought that it will create a lot of economic activities uh, around the globe. It will create an alternate financial system, which is otherwise dominated by West in form of uh, International Monetary Fund and World Bank, which basically uh, so far serve only the interest of Western countries. We, uh, as you know that uh, IMF and World Bank are always dominated and their presidents always come either by from Europe or from uh, United States of America. So uh, their mandate is very clear and the entire financial system which is governed by them will have an alternate in form of China. China has also invested heavily and given uh, very long-term loans to almost every major African countries and also many Asian countries in form of creating infrastructure. But Chinese model has been always that when they give this economic assistance, may it be in case of uh, uh, CPEC, this is the China-Pakistan economic corridor, uh, or it may be in several countries including Kenya, Tanzania, South Africa is that 
when they uh, give economic assistance uh, to those countries it is in for not only in form of capital but it also means that it is a chinese capital it is chinese labor and it is also chinese material so essentially they are self funding their domestic industries uh, at the cost of some other country and therefore they not only bring a poor lot of money but they also bring the labor force in those countries and in many cases not even a small piece of screw driver uh, screw uh, can be purchased from a local country everything is imported from china and when uh, this enormous debt is unbearable to uh, the country china ask for the ownership or equity in those projects essentially converting that loan into equity and therefore becoming the owner of that uh, infrastructure and the classic case you must be knowing is about the port number to port in the sri lanka and also the largest port, uh, airport they have built in sri lanka which is which was termed as a worst mts airport because uh, the infrastructure was so big and the number of flights coming there were so low that both the programs becomes uh, projects become economically unviable and china virtually bought it but people are becoming aware of it uh, just uh, last month uh, tanzania has rejected uh, chinese loan of uh, 10 billion dollars and they say that only fool will accept such condition that was a statement of tanzanian president Uh, so there is some awakening but these are uh, only exceptions there are and there will be many more countries including our neighbor on west pakistan who will undergo under tremendous pressure of chinese debt and it will be a sovereign question in front of them on how to repay them and the only option they may have is to transfer the ownership of this huge infrastructure they have created uh, to china but chinese uh, interference does not remain only in case of infrastructure as uh, but they also interfere in the political system they also interfere in the religious system they also interfere in the social uh, system there are no clashes in certain african countries between chinese laborers who have uh, settled there after the projects are over and uh, they have come in contact with local communities local women and a uh, new progeny a hybrid progeny of africa and african china chinese are also uh, emerging in some part of the world and they are likely to change the demographic situation in the decades to come so definitely china is is and will continue to pose an enormous challenge to practically every country in the civilized world who believe in the democracy uh, who believe in the rule of law and who believe in the certain principle of coexistence among the countries and more to say about china is also its enormous and enhancing military power which is uh kind of uh, agri- uh, always keeping aggressive postures uh, within all the neighbors uh, in their uh, periphery and therefore threatening all the time small countries including vietnam uh, south korea and as far as countries like australia uh, with their military might in that respect now if you come to other major powers like america so even though as professor mahapatra has said that uh, america still remains a major major uh, military power and its military exp- uh, annual budget is 
more than aggregate budget of other 10 most important countries who spend maximum on the military. So if you rank the, uh, the countries based on their military expenses, the budgetary expenses, uh, definitely US comes on the top. And then if you add the military budget of number two to number 10, uh, that budget also still remains less than the military budget of United States. And they continue to enhance their technology. Uh, but at the same time, it, there are now trends within US uh, is to have less and less engaged with the global affairs. And that kind of a situation uh, again gives a space uh, because nothing can remain in vacuum. Uh, space uh, for countries like chi China and Russia to an extent to uh, spread their uh, influence uh, into these countries. And a classic example is Central Asia and also in the uh, part of East Asia. Uh, Turkey, Yemen, where very conflicting forces are right now uh, playing uh, their war games. And depending on who stands where, you can see the situation changing dynamically, uh, sometimes overnight. So few year, uh, as you remember, just to give one instance that one Russian plane was shot down by Turkey uh, and therefore almost they were on the verge of war but la in last few months you can see the new kind of cooperation between US uh, between Russia and Turkey uh, so that uh, the American influence in that region uh, goes uh, it's in order that uh, should go down so this is kind of weird uh, sometimes uh, which defies all the logic, uh, these kind of alliances are being taken, uh, are emerging, and they will continue to emerge even uh, in the future. Third part is uh, of this whole game, or is a puzzle, is Europe. And the Europe is overall, is in a flux, and I would say that uh, their influence on the global affair is definitely lowering uh, in the last decade or so, and it will continue to do so because they are more again involved partly because of their own questions. They also are facing enormous uh, challenges because of their uh, because of uh, flux of immigrants uh, after the Syrian war, uh, Muslim immigrants mostly, and because of their uh, open boundaries, uh, the de there are enormous demographic changes are taking place in Europe, including UK. And those changes are resulting into increased crime against women, uh, increased thefts and murders, and uh, so-called uh, tranquility in Europe is being disturbed very rapidly in many countries. Uh, and if you see the enhanced increased crime rates in those countries, they themselves uh, will prove what I'm trying to say. Economically also, uh, Western Europe especially is uh, not doing great. Their growth rate is uh, very minimal and their uh, population is aging, especially the working population is age, uh, not there and therefore this influx of immigrant which they think will partly substitute uh, this working population is actually creating a lot of social tensions and law and order issues in these uh, European countries. And it is not likely to change uh, in the near future. The last one is a very enigmatic country to an extent, which is Russia. 
on one side is trying to reassert and reclaim its position as one of the alternatives to United States of America. But at the same time, their economy is also is not very strong. Their main supplies of you know, export, which is the natural gas and the oil, is also in uh, trouble because of the falling oil prices. And there will be a political stability, as you must have seen last week only Mr. Putin has been allowed to stay as the president for uh, next, I guess, 12 years or 18 years. Uh, so there will be a political stability as in China, but how Russia as a country will emerge as economically strong will be a matter to be seen. But at the same time, they are very strong militarily and as well as being a strong nuclear power will continue to play a big role in the global affairs. Lastly, I would touch upon the Middle East countries. There is a big change that is happening in those countries also, because again, the oil prices which have crossed $100 per barrel at just a few years back, five, seven years back, are now trading some 30, 40 uh, dollars per barrel. And it is putting a lot of stress on their very lavish spending uh, based economy and uh, it, the oil prices are not likely to go high and reach uh, some 80 90 dollars per barrel in the near future and it will again cause the enormous stress in their on their balance sheet but at the same time they are very cash rich and they are investing into the new areas they are acquiring global firms and therefore they will continue to have a big money power uh, globally, even though their strategic power in terms of uh, in, in, in terms of controlling the oil supply or energy supply and therefore in enhancing their bargaining power with the with rest of the world is clearly declining, also partly because of the new countries like Russia. Uh, like United States also, uh, who have become now uh, major suppliers of uh, energy across the world because of the shale oil revolution in US. Uh, as you know that even in India, uh, we are now buying close to 8% of our oil from the United States. And therefore, our dependence of the country like India is also relatively less dependent on the Middle East as far as our oil uh, global supply is. So this is by and large the overall scenario as of today. It is very difficult to predict what will emerge as a new world order or will, be there, will there be any new world order which is rule based, which is based on mutual understanding and of course competitiveness, but fair play. And I don't see that is to happen in the, the at least over a decade or so, uh, partly because of the uh, Chinese assertiveness, which basically doesn't uh, believe in any rule of law, uh, while they only say that whatever is convenient to them is the rule and the relative reluctance of the major global powers to play a major and assertive role uh, in, the, in the world affairs because they themselves are busy in the domestic affairs. So overall, I say that uh, the next decade or so will remain uh, in a great flux. And in that situation, India, which is unique, position and advantages can play a major role within its limitations. Of course, India has limitations in terms of both economic power and uh, the military power, which is uh, not as big as several developed countries uh, in the world. 
uh, our resources are likely to be more and more consumed uh, for the development of our own citizens and which is quite natural but india's uh, approach of cooperative development is likely to play a major role in this exploitative development model of china and therefore india can create its niche space in the global affairs uh, and put forward an alternative model uh, cause the political stability is also very well established in india we have a leader like uh, prime minister modi ji uh, who can uh, play a major role not only because of his vision but also his proactive leadership uh, and we are quite fortunate to have someone like him at the helm of affairs uh, at this critical juncture and therefore i am reasonably confident that india will be able to uh, create its own space in this uh, flux and uh, give some stability to the world affairs thank you very much vijay chotada ji i think he were the lately uh, mentioned the the flux character of the changing international order and uh, indirectly hinting that nothing much is going to change though unlike some of the scholars so far good at the end of the cold war the new international system would look much like the past so almost the same line you say the so called emerging international system may look more like what is the system today nothing much would change <clears throat> basically the, uh, the 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 flux character the nature of international system is it remain flux as it is um i think uh, the very insightful presentation and you have covered almost all the issues the very important issues which all the countries uniformly on varying degree have been confronting second you have touched on all the key areas which do matter in the foreign policy making of any country particularly the ascendant power like india and uh, finally you very briefly touched upon the cooperative development model represented by india in contrast to the chinese model which though they have been trying very hard to peddle it abroad supplemented by the chinese philosophy down on the history and the centerpiece of the historical understanding their understanding of imperial china uh, is uh, tianjia uh, tianjia tianjia basically and of of late they have constitutionalized it by saying the china would be at the middle at the the center of the world all others would be either assimilated and those who refused to be assimilated they were exterminated and they were branded by the chinese as the barbarians the lastly the barbarian term reserved for the europeans who they hold responsible for the 100 years of humiliation humiliation from 1800 till about 1945 okay and this is what the chinese school children have been taught since 1991 in the aftermath of 1800 uh, sorry uh, 1989 the tenement episode the the chinese undertook this program called the ideological education program which largely focused on the chinese uh, youth being taught about history what are the history history basically centered around not rise and fall of china fall and rise fall and rise not rise and fall that was a great imperial china which was more a civilization than a typical sovereign nation state how it was battered and destroyed with invasion occupation and the massacre of the chinese by the europeans russians and european influence russian and the japanese and the chinese have been this, the children have been taught to remember those days they basically remembering the chosen trauma at the same time to remind them about the chosen glory of the glory eclipsed by the traumatic period they, ex- they experienced in the hands of the europeans and japanese this remains a kind of source source of inspiration from their eminent xi jinping's idea of national rejuvenation the national rejuvenation basically chief speaks about is very much encapsulated in his dream called chinese dream what does it mean it means china would be restored to the central place where it was at the imperial period 
So China would become the modern world power. All other power either would become a part of this tributary system headed by China, or they become simply vessels like Nepal, Pakistan, and they would be simply, you know, uh, kowtowing to Chinese authority without having without having any voice. So that is the kind of vision the Chinese have. They are the, since 2012, they've been trying very hard to replace America by saying America is the outside power, so the Indo-Pacific region is concerned, and they have every right to rule, not rule based on consensus, a rule on certain set of principles, the rules which they define, they dictate. So that could be reason why we write it, Prime Minister Modi described, without them mentioning his name, that expansionist, and that's a very good designation, I tell, most appropriate. I think no other country deserves this designation than PRC today. And second most important is, even if they claim they do not have the border dispute with many countries, this is simply a blatant lie. They may have resolved these border differences with countries like Rasa or some Central Asian Republic, but you have to actually study the kind of agreement it was reached between them. That was ultimate net gain for China. So far, the agreement with the Central Asian countries concerned. That's a fact. This is what perhaps they have been trying of late to impose in India by flexing the muscles, by bullying us, and they have been unsuccessful. So what I'm saying, when you look for an okay, international system, all of us in varying degree have been critical of the US-dominated international system, but it does offer certain scope, space for us to articulate the views. There is a space, there is a scope for the people inside the Americas to oppose particular policy. Look at the enter Vietnam syndrome. But there is no scope so far China is concerned. China, in fact, has in a way has hijacked the, in, the, the democracy which is available to China so that it's external policy, external relations concern. And internally, there is no democracy at all. It is a surveillance state par excellence. It is worse than Gaddafi's Libya or, or Saddam's Iraq. So look at the best example is the firewall. What does it mean? You simply block all kind of information. You don't share with your people. And that is a rogue country today monopolizing all the economic resources and trying to translate the resources into its power overseas. So think of the long-term implications so far the international system is concerned. Forget about my country's interest. So that is the that is the biggest challenge being posed by a rogue party state China. That has to be collectively challenged. And that is what we should, should, should remain a source of concern, may not remain a source of concern for the Communist Party of India Marxists. Like the Brinda Karat and Sitara Mashuri, they have the different agenda. Let them pursue it. But that is something source of concern for the enter humanity. And that they, they enter COVID-19 is nothing but a trigger. All of us, you know, just simply try to ignore it or simply downplay it. The time has come for us to wake up. That's a real wake up call. The time has come. What I keep saying, now or never. We'll not get a chance again. We'll leave it again, let me tell you. And a couple of years down the line, China will get back with greater virulence and vengeance. It will not spare us. They will not forget. This is what they have been taught historically. They don't have religion. There's a history is a religion. They are in no way different from the Islamic, the Islamist terror. I'm just, you need to understand the Chinese psyche. That's very, very important for so the policy making is concerned. You know, what you call expansionist, they say these are natural, these are territory naturally belong to them. They have been taken away unfairly by, by others, which belong to the ancestors. Has come to them by, from the ancestors, like whether it's Arunachal Pradesh or Ladakh or any area in Central Asia, anywhere. That is the kind of expansionist ambition, the aim they have. That's the reason they keep saying, how do you call us expansionist? We're trying to retrieve the land which are taken away from us. That's a major point of difference. We need to understand that needs to be brought home to the policymakers. That's the point. Yeah? What I keep saying, it's, it's China is quite a different ball game. You can't compare China with the United States of America. It's enter international system is based on set of rules and principles which all of us wearing things subscribe to. That is a liberal democracy. And China represents the opposite of it. And that's why they've been off late trying to you know, the sell out to the world. Look at Indian democracy, chaotic, no progress. Indian democracy model is a failure. Which is success? Chinese democracy, Chinese model, which is bereft of democracy. So I think these are some of the issues I just wanted to uh, throw up before you for all of you to reflect on it. I may be wrong, 
that's just my own understanding of the situation being a simple as a what i call this subaltern academician put it this way uh, i don't belong to the mainstream academician uh, like the, the couple of them get strategies but that's my understanding of the threat i see emanating from across the border from china in a broader context i see what has happened in the golan uh, valley is a real wake up call and i keep saying the threshold is broken now we should go back the time has come for us to remain assertive and challenge the what i call the ideologically driven mission of a land hungry nation that is china we should challenge militarily not diplomatically militarily and coercively use your power that you have at your command without wasting time if possible even form an informal alliance so as to ensure not the change, change of regime the breakdown of china into pieces at least seven states then we can establish a primacy there's no other scope i'm sorry to say this that is my ultimate goal breakdown of prc and that will open up the space for my country to retain its primacy and the what i call indian character of south asia for the south asia's indian primacy in this region itself is being constantly contested by the chinese forces into the area will be marginalized in own area which the americans question is south asia it is essentially it is indocentric it is indian region not south asia so that's keeping all that long term sort of interest i think our strategists need to formulate a kind of grand strategy as to how to combat and contain the likely chinese influence in the years to come if this opportunity miss out willingly unwillingly willingly i don't know if we miss out what a long term policy to contain and combat china with the china will remain assertive as long as it is ruled by the ccp ccp and with the pl thank you very much for your attention sir dr chothai wale ji what changes have come in the indian foreign policy or india's approach towards the world since 2014 because you have been very much part of that and you have very actively proactively uh, organized uh, some of those uh, large events uh, in uh, uk in usa uh, and you have made a you can say vast outreach into the people of indian origin uh, based abroad so what change has come and how that particular change in the thinking and the approach and the confidence level uh is going to play a larger role in india acquiring a rightful place in the you can say committee of nations so things becoming you can say very hot and very unstable having you can say seen the government performing and changing you can say its its, uh, its approach then the previous governments uh, i would request you to please elaborate on what changes has come in terms of thinking in terms of approach and in terms of you can say strategy thank you very much sir so there are four or five uh, hallmarks of india's foreign policy since 2014 when prime minister modi ji has won the elections first one is that now there is a tighter integration between india's uh, domestic policies and foreign policy and our foreign policy establishment is now fine tuned to you know, in addition to cater our strategic and global interest also uh, they are keen to cater our domestic interests second is of course there is a huge civilizational connect uh that we have reestablished otherwise indian foreign policy establishment was uh, quite shy of our civilizational uh, values third is that we have overcome several uh, constraints which uh, we are actually tie, tying up uh, like our hands were tied up and when we did uh, surgical strikes or when we did air strikes across the international boundary over pakistan we have overcome such constraints we also had several historical hesitations 
like uh, indian prime minister never visited israel uh, so those historical hesitations also we have overcome and we have established relations with countries like israel but at the same time uh, it, the relationship with israel is not at the cost of our close relationship with the uh, gulf countries islamic countries and last but not least which you have also mentioned is that we have given a sense of belonging to our vast indian diaspora spread across the globe and uh, we have reconnected them re-energized them uh, and we try to make them uh, a part of our overall uh, development agenda and we are reasonably successful also in it uh, it has also resulted into uh, raising of these diasporas uh, in, as a political powerhouse in their respective countries and many countries who which uh, otherwise uh, have taken these uh, people kind, kind of granted are now more and more looking them uh, as a party as a participants in the their domestic uh, policy, politics, and agenda, which is a very good sign for India. So these are four or five salient features I would like to uh, elaborate or, or emphasize as far as India's foreign policy is concerned in past six years. Thank you. Kapil Kapoor, sir, is here. I have tended to look upon China and India as affiliated civilizations. Affiliated. And uh, I'm aware of the 62 war, I'm aware of 85, and uh, also 96 or 7, one skirmish. And of course, the one we have had now, which is a little more serious. I want to suggest, sir, that China, we all know, as you have said, sir, that strong China in history has been an expansionist China. It is their tendency because the present day China is itself the result of occupation of so many lands, Mongolia and etc. Expansionist China. But in spite of that, the Chinese people particularly uh, have, a, have some kind of an affinity with India. Affinity with India. They feel an affinity. And I, I personally am of the opinion, sir, that uh, India and China should not be looked upon as foes, but as rivals. Rivals. And uh, what's happening today, that a bully is being blocked by a well-intentioned friend. And you have to, you have to block him. To block him, you have to use the use the weapons that he's using, the bully. So we have to make the bully realize that he can't go on. But at the same time, I will not agree with the, my friend uh, Mahapatra ji that India has to think of military solution as the only solution. I will not agree with that. Because uh, uh, everybody realizes the, the implications of such a such a thing. It's more a war game. It's a mind game. Mind game and it's a question of who will wink first. My other other observations are, you see, of the, in the last uh, 40, 50, 60 years, 1950 ke baad, when India handed over Tibet, Tibet to China, which the British had not done. The British had not done, but we handed over. And uh, we followed some uh, mistaken, although Nehruji had no respect for Mahatma Gandhi's thought, but he took his, you know, peace message very seriously in relation to, you know, those doves flying and uh, attitude to China without having any real politic understanding of, uh, of uh, international, international relations. So he handed over China. Tibet. But China has an, uh, China is uneasy about, uneasy about 
Tibet in relation to India continues to be uneasy because Dalai Lama Ji came here about fifth, and you know, today the Tibetans form a large population, large population. And you know, China, we have allowed Dalai Lama Ji to have a set up a government, quite rightly. So they're a little uneasy. To balance their uneasiness, they supported Pakistan on Kashmir. And they are continuing to do that. Pakistan and Kashmir. And they do it on all international. Why do they why do they oppose our entry into UNO? Why do they why do they you know oppose us wherever they can? Because apart from these uh, policy matters, they want to keep the screw tightened on India to sort of you know destabilize if they can, they can't now, so that the FDIs, foreign investment, and the factories that are moving out should not opt for India. India is a natural option because earlier it was Taiwan and South Korea, but now Singapore, now the labor there costs as much as, you know, in the West. But in India, the conditions are much better. So if you can spoil the conditions in India, working conditions in India, then China will, will, will continue to have the factories, international factories that are working there. Now these are, I think these are the compulsions and pinpricks that it does. You see, this was a, this was a new dimension in Galwan that came, they came with uh, you know, those uh, nails, nailed, uh, nailed, uh, you know, things. And uh, they got a response also. And I think they have a better appreciation what Indians can do. You know, I read somewhere that an army of lions led by a donkey will be defeated by an army of donkeys led by a lion. Today, India is led by a lion. And uh, and I think they have learned. They, they will learn their lesson. They learn. They are very wise people. And in intrinsically, intrinsically, China Chinese government knows that a war with India, the Chinese people will not accept. Will not accept. Just as the Nepalese people will not accept the Nepalese government fighting India. This is my hunch. I agree with some of your observation. I have some differences uh, in your uh, some of the observation. Yes, sir. First of all, your first part before uh, this Ladakh incident, uh, I would have hundred percent agree with you that India and China uh, will remain as the competitor and also collaborator at the same time. And I have mentioned it uh, at several places in last five years. So I always say that India-China relations is this complicated. Complicated. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, and there is a basis for this. For example, I will tell you during the Doklan crisis, which was also a grave crisis between India and China. Actually, the trade between India and China has gone up by thirty percent. So, essentially, till this Galwan. So, or the issue happened, we were able to keep a uh, dissect between our strategic interest and the commercial priorities or commercial interests separately, and that many countries are doing. For example, China and Taiwan are the are the worst kind of enemies as far as the strategic interests are concerned, but they have enormous and very close trade relations between each other, and there are many other countries like. That. So it's not so China has kept commerce separately than their strategic interest to a, to a certain extent. But the Galwan has changed the equations. And therefore, uh, this will have very long term and uh, adverse impact even on India China relations on all fronts not only on the strategic front, but also including the commercial and economic front. So that is as far as the current. Second part, it could be a little uh, uh, naive to 
uh, accept or to presume that if we would not have given shelter to the Dalai, Dalai Lama, Chinese would have been friendly to us. So, because there, as you have rightly said in your second part, that their main objective, and now it has been much more explicit after Mr. Xi Jinping has come, is not only expansionist, but also kill all sorts of rivals or potential rivals. Yeah. Uh, kill doesn't mean the physical killing, but uh, keep them suppressed. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it is a part of their agenda. And they know that India, because of its population, because of its geography, and because of the international support it is gaining increasingly, it can become a potential rival to them. And therefore, uh, they will do everything in their uh, in their sleeves to undermine India's interest or stop India's engagement on the global platform, etc. And that's why they are not allowing us to become a part of UNSC or nuclear supply group, etc. But, but after saying that, I would not go become as radical as as far as the geographical disintegration of China, because we know that neither it is feasible as of today, nor uh, it will ensure us that it will create a kind of uh, tranquility which we are seeking for. Uh, sometimes it is easier to deal with one person rather than dealing seven person, seven uh, different identities. Uh, so I would not go into that extreme but uh, after galwan unless uh, there is some major change on either side uh, i see the situation will remain little bit on the adversarial side rather than on the friendlier side with china thank I you guess, sir uh, thank <laughs> you. so far india china policy is concerned we are lulled into believing chinese are fond of indians Everywhere you go, people are fond of Indians. Yeah. When it comes to the, uh, you know, uh, uh, grabbing job, I think they tend to get a little jealous of Indians, whether in France or Britain or any European country, because they'll find Indians everywhere. They're competing for all these pussy jobs. But then, sir, you are talking about China, which is a party state, is a CCP. It is the Chinese who have no voice, no role to play. They're not like Indians. That's the problem, sir. You need to understand the Chinese psyche. And last 25 years, basically, nationalism has been used by the CCP as the source of legitimacy. And that nationalism, in a way, has, you know, has been embedded into the minds of the Chinese youth to the extent they become quite insolent, hawkish. They think this is China. It's this hand population which constitute the overwhelming majority as a country where you'll find more than 63% are occupied, do not originally belong to China. So that's the thing that you have to keep in mind. You are talking with China. So people to people relation would not yield a desired result because it's a country ruled by the CCP. Is a, is a, they have a standing committee comprising between eight to 10 members which now of late has been accommodating all these great, uh, what I call the, the capitalist. So, sir, you need to understand their political structure. There is no election. I know you come, you come around saying that's again a kind of propaganda by these, the, the, the American professors who have been in the payroll of Beijing, like the Rajiv Gandhi Foundation in India and the Chinese Center in Delhi, which for some time in the payroll of the, 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 the Beijing, they are the ones who have been, you know, you know, singing a different in a different tone, saying, "Oh, Chinese are known for the deliberative democracy." Well, one then what democracy it is? So that is one major point of difference. So when I talk about democracy, the war factor of the military, uh, you know, conflict, what I mean is, we should project that way. That is the basically projection. We are here to stand up to China, Chinese bullying. We are not another Vietnam or Indonesia. You know, th these are the smaller countries in its vicinity have been have adopted this strategical hedging strategy because the Americans didn't come to the help they needed it in the Indo-Pacific region. So we have to so that's a way we can put pressure on the Chinese government. Number two, number three is the international environment is quite conducive. This is the time for us to come together 
you know, and put sufficient pressure on the CCP, possibly there would be a changing of the guard. Xi Jinping is a dictator in the making. You read his book published in 2014, it's a compilation of his statement in Chinese language. Here is a man who is totally guided by history, the imperial history, which has been idealized like anything. So this, when, I, when I say he is another Saddam Hussein I'm making, he is a megalomaniac. He thinks time has come for the China, China to assert itself to occupy that historic position which naturally belongs to China. So if somebody is guided, driven by this kind of ambition, you can deal with them. And, and the party that you have called the CCP. So we look forward to that kind of change, what I call the change of a guard. If not, then let the government come under that kind of pressure, diplomatic, political, economic pressure, and the pressure of war. Because China today is not a position to sustain, to go for a war, because if the cost of war would be disproportionately more for China than to India. It's an emerging economy, the second largest economy, which has replaced Japan since 2010 as the economic powerhouse. So what I'm saying, you need to put up that kind of pressure on China, so that that could be a kind of popular uprising, repeat of Tiananmen, Tiananmen score of 18, 1989, is a possibility. So we look for a regime change, and the regime change, we can put sustained pressure on this, the next regime to bring out a sort of reform, the changes, which will ultimately help our Tibet and brothers. So what I'm saying, sir, you need to see the difference in terms of nature of state. That's been important. You have to put pressure, but putting pressure is not equal to fighting a war. You see a bully, you are facing a bully. You have to become an equal, equally strong bully. China is hello testing, you know, in Galwan. Hello testing. You know, it's called hello testing. How much do you have? And if we had had another five years and then Galwan, then China would not have done Galwan. Because we are now fairly strong militarily, but we are a little notch. And also we are at present, I think we have, uh, I mean, China hopes that uh, we will be fighting on three fronts. And I think we can soon eliminate the two other fronts and have only one front. And then we will be as good a bully as China and we don't need to fight. You have to be strong. You increase your strength, economic and military. And you will not need to fight a war. You will be forced to fight a war if you are economically weaker. And if you are militarily weaker than China, China will impose a war on you. So, sir, we have to agree. I am not, I, I don't think the Chinese people or China also sees much merit in fighting with India. They will mutually destroy each other. A question was that China and Pakistan are not going to be able to fight उस परिस्थिति में भारत के लिए विश्व स्तर पर अपना समर्थन जुटाने का और बढ़ाने का क्या प्रयास और क्या हो सकता है और क्या उसकी संभावना है एक ये प्रश्न है दूसरा प्रश्न नेपाल के बारे में है कि जो नेपाल का हम 2015 में जो डेवलपमेंट हुआ क्या उसके कारण नेपाल में भारत के प्रति थोड़ा नाराजगी है और उसका असर हमें देखने को मिल रहा है और तीसरा जो प्रश्न था वह प्रश्न है कि चीन के बारे में है कि चीन जिस तरह से अपनी नीति विस्तारवादी नीति पे चल रहा है तो भारत के पास उसका तोड़ क्या है डॉक्टर चौथाई वाले जी इट इज वेरी इट्स वेरी डिफिकल्ट टू हैव एनी यूनैनिमिटी ऑन द इशू ऑफ चाइना एज फार एज है फेसिंग बोथ द एडवर्सरीज इज कंसर्न माय अंडरस्टैंडिंग इज दैट इंडियन मिलिट्री स्ट्रेटजी इज ऑलवेज एज्यूम uh about it and i am very sure that they are equally prepared for it uh, third part is about nepal yes it's a very difficult situation there but i think what we need to do is to segregate our civilizational relations with nepal with the current political establishment there but before that we also need to accept and wholeheartedly accept that Nepal is a sovereign state. It has its own priorities right now. It has its own identity. Of course, we have a lot of commonalities. We have Hinduism as the common thread. We have Roti Viti Ka uh, We have passport free entry into each other. Uh, 
but at the same time geographically it is an independent country independent state that we have to accept it and therefore at a at a political level uh, there are bound to be some differences between two of us and therefore we should respect right now whatever is happening is because purely because of the domestic compulsions of chinese ruling party because of the severe differences they are having within themselves and therefore they are making india as a tool to cover and protect their own interests and uh, india has taken a very right and mature stand of uh, not allowing uh, not allowing these politicians uh to make india as a pawn in their domestic politics by giving very restrained statements on whatever uh, abuses that those have been hurled on us including indian virus etc and just two days uh, whatever has been said by uh, nepal's prime minister about india uh, we will not allow it to happen so that uh, in india's cordial relations with nepalese people uh, will be uh, damaged and politics will take its own course uh, and we will deal at that level without uh, damaging our relations with nepalese people that's what i think is the best strategy thank you is our question about what is the relevance of united nations in the changing global order i, I will not say that uh, united nations have become defunct and uh, irrelevant but yes every institution every organization needs to rediscover itself needs to transform as per the changing needs uh, otherwise they become stagnant and some of the arms of united nations uh, those who are still uh, time wrapped uh, in the cold war era and in the uh, post second world war scenario needs to be changed and uh, in that respect reform of united nations security council is absolutely must it is really a great tragedy that uh, almost two third of the world's population is not represented in united nations security council and at the same time some of the countries which were very powerful after second world war but have significantly diminished their ability uh, to influence global affairs in 21st century they are enjoying uh, their veto power it's a very unfair scenario and uh, unless that is changed uh, effectiveness of united nations as a mechanism will uh, have enormous limit uh, being in services i wish to share certain things uh, which have not been part of uh, the open terrain so far the one is one incident and remember we've had a large number of such incidents in the past but it has not taken the center stage so far this is for the first time that it has taken the center stage in addition to this india and china as vijay sir has said have got huge economic cooperation we have to be strong on both sides i uh, fully subscribe the tone of kapil sir when he says that unless you are strong people will not respect you it is what chanakya came to say in his strategy is that sam dand dam bhed aur dand sam is over bhed must continue now what remains is dam and the uh, finally dand so if we can collaborate this to see what tanakya said in terms of your neighboring nations and smaller nations bangladesh sri lanka pakistan china they have to be our our best friends and we have to make attempts towards that china should have done that with respect to india we understand their economy is nine times us their forces are superior to that end but that does not give me leave that i am weak i am equally strong come that day and uh, i'm sure we will give them a befitting reply thank you uh, professor mahapatra being uh, an expert of uh, west asia 
uh, whatever the you can say developments have been taking place we must have to become conscious of all the issues relevant to it uh, regarding the oil security and a large number of people based in the west asia indians uh, based in west west asia so professor mahapatra so there would be definitely the iranian retaliation but uh, iranian themselves also are not in a position to sustain in a prolonged conflict with any country be it saudi arabia or israel so you need to also take into account the inherent structural constraint or the limitation and top of it the ayatollah khamenei the 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 real sense the head of iran uh, islamic republic of iran uh, the latest report suggests that he is not in proper health like state of health and uh, he is not in a position to guide his people so very soon there will be a kind of power transition in iran itself so one never knows what would the approach of the next generation leadership and there may be the in house conflict within the the, the ruling clerical elements iran so uh, uh, but as it is iran is likely to plunge into a spell of political chaos political chaos during this inter transition period there's a possibility and that possibility does also raise the hope of the liberal forces prevailing over these conservative clerics there's a possibility that's the country the conflict going on for some time now more than more than two decades uh, so keeping this in mind i don't think this conflict could spread over across west asia and there are too many players in west asia that's israel and iran not the only one you have turkey you have saudi arabia you have syria a lot many actors there so but then they also have the stake in preserving stability so they don't do anything which would destabilize the region that at a time when they're struggling with the covid 19 there are very very other very many other dimensions also for example the 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 road that china the cpc and the other road that is making and the relationship that china tried to establish with the silk silk route you know in the 5th 6th century ad so china also plays upon its history and historical connections just as india can also play and in fact uh, i think it was easy to see from the present uh, pre president of uh, china or prime minister uh, no li he he said that india has ruled china for 2000 years without sending a single soldier because the buddhism was accepted in china because of its affiliation with confucianism these are both conduct philosophies aachar vyavhar ke darshan hai bane and sir mahapatra ji to say chinese are not religious is wrong if you visit the shaolin temple the early, one of the earliest buddhist temples in china second century first century ad you have almost 80000 chinese visiting it every day every day and their their mode of worship is not different from ours they put agarbattis in a big you know of ashes and when i the only thing the difference is they don't take off their shoes when they enter the sanctum sanctorum so when i started taking off my shoes all of them stood the staff and they folded their hands to me because inside them inside them is there is their ancient chinese self and also you know in the center of china there are over 250 kilometers across you have lotse temple you have a, you have a, uh, this uh, confucius temple you see and either you have shaolin shaolin lotse and confucius and in the confucius temple you know they have a tree which is 2000 years old there is a small leaf growing on the top they have barricaded it and they say please don't touch it he is alive he is alive the wisher so much and i asked our uh, one professor of philosophy peking university that is this 300 kilometers china or is shanghai china is a shanghai will come and go but this is china shaolin confucius and laozi so in the longer perspective longer perspective i do not like to think that we are enemies so at a time when global supply chains are being disrupted is there any area that india can particularly take advantage of 
see the supply chain to me as a straight up international politics is a more a myth. Okay. Let me begin with very briefly, this is a brief background of this. You know, uh, in international relation theory, something called interdependence. That's called the complex interdependence. The, the interdependence theory is based on the premise of co-joining of international politics and economics, which earlier seen as two parallel lines. They never meet, okay, in 1670s. The debate started in 70s. The debate basically is centered around something called the hegemony. Where the American hegemonic status for the first time was challenged with the rise of Japan, post World War II Japan. So basically, then there was a correlation which is established subsequently in 1988 with the publication book by Paul Kennedy, Rise and Fall of Great Powers, between economic growth and military power. Okay, the correlation between them. So then that was subsequently, you know, uh, traced to constitute the basis of the inter interdependence theory basis of which China was accommodated from 1971 that started with President Nixon visit. First time he had written an article for an FES way back in 1967, where he categorically spelled out the world would not change or would not remain safe if China doesn't change. Okay. From 71 onwards, successive American administrations went on, okay, scalloping the bilateral relation between America and China from to normalization relationship to constructive engagement. So much so, the interdependence become a kind of overly dependence of America on China, so far supply chain is concerned. Do you understand? From the consumer product to anything that you mentioned under the sun, except the military hardware, used to be imported from China. Recall those, they, they had a bilateral dual uh, feud way back in 2007 regarding the nature of the uh, uh, the health products or the consumer products being exported by China at that time to America. That's quite defective. Okay. So there is, that's created a hue and cry. The Americans said, what nonsense, what kind of products you are getting from China? But they continued. So the whole the issue of interdependence became overly dependence of America on China for so the consumption of the American, average Americans concerned. And this marked a shift from American dependence on ASEAN countries in the 50s and 60s, okay, to China. So all the big companies, so this gradually simply, you know, petered out. So what I'm saying, so supply chain subsequently was controlled by, this, by the Chinese company, which also includes several Japanese and American companies located there. Yes, it would be dis disturbed, <coughs> but something disturbed doesn't mean it's the end of the world. Things should take its own course, other things should come up. Look the kind of problem we're facing in India. So the banning of 59 apps. Now we have the G, uh, uh, GeoMate. We have the something else which is likely to replace the TikTok. Should this something will work out, the Americans are definitely going to work it out. And there's a possibility the Americans are likely to shift all that, the supply chain business from China to Asian countries, which may include Malaysia, Vietnam, and uh, maybe smaller countries around there. We are not going to benefit from this, unfortunately. So you must have heard about nearly 3,000 companies which have of late exited from Japan. Say Lionshare has gone to Vietnam. You know, very, very few companies have turned towards India so far, unfortunately. That's what happened. But that will be disrupted. But then there are ways of, I know, it will take some time. Uh, this will continue for some time. But this is what being, you know, dangled by the Chinese. Oh, you are so much dependent structured on us, you can you know, shiver the ties with us all at one go. But we have to sow to the Chinese. We're not dependent for our survival. Like, let the Americans also sow it. This is what President Trump is doing. 